and I'll speak about our research called Digital Life of Russian Regions or Russian Megapolises. And we've done two waves of this research. I won't go into the details of the findings that much. I will more focus on the methodology on the one hand and on the other hand on the possible outtakes for business or political decision making because I think that's important and that probably gives perspective on how and why we can approach this as a joint project for future development with, with IMS uh, network. And definitely uh, there are good and strong insights for business and that's why probably we uh, have made it as a co-branded report with EY. We have discussed it with Moscow office and they liked our findings and they had some ideas on the methodology. So we talked to Alexey Rybnikov and then we talked to uh, Sasha Yevlev. Uh, so we are really very really thankful to, to the Moscow office of EY for the support. I, I do have, uh, I do have uh, more, more copies uh, and probably it may help to, to, to look uh, into the copy, because I will not present the whole of this report, it's quite massive, uh, and I guess you are not really that much interested in differences between Kazan and Ufa, even if you know where they are. Um, so, methodology, what, what we are seeking to, to measure, actually. And basically, the idea behind this is that Initially, when internet was penetrating, online was, penet uh, was developing, uh, and the, the question was how many people can access internet, how many people can go online. So there were all kinds of measurement of how many, what percentage of the population goes online, what is the bandwidth, and what's the broadband, etc., uh, etc. Et but now all this comes to the point of saturation, at least in Russia. Um, definitely in the advanced markets, but I guess in many cities of China, for example, it's also quite close to the point of saturation. And we can see that out of 15 biggest Russian cities, in 12, 15, in all the cities, it was over 70% of population going online regularly. And so probably there is not that much difference uh, whether it's 70 or 75 or even 80. Moscow was on top with uh, 92, 93. Uh, but the question is what comes next? And when this saturation point is um, reached and the primary digitalization is generally completed. So what comes next theoretically is the digital starts to penetrate uh, everyday life. And all types of actors start to use digital for different purposes. And the model is quite simple. If we speak about cities, if we speak about, uh, and we speak about cities because they're the core uh, locke or core places where uh, social and economic life is happening in the, in the modern environment. Then we have human beings, we have businesses, we have administrations. And all those get enabled by digital technologies. All those start to do things somehow differently by using digital. And then we get into the stage of what we call secondary digitalization, when it's, it's really about how people are using their capabilities, the infrastructure that was installed. And from the measurement point of view, from the research point of view, this poses quite a problem. Because it was very, very easy, relatively very, very easy, to measure the accessibility, to measure the connectivity. You just go and find how many people go online, or you measure the average bandwidth or whatever. For the secondary digitalization, we need to do something multidimensional. We need to have a model of life basically, and then we need to have a way to measure uh, across this model. So it's, and definitely in terms of getting the data, it becomes a multi-source exercise, which makes it a bit complicated. So the model we came to is, um, we calculate unified index across seven dimensions of life, modern life, which are transportation, finance, healthcare, administration, uh, education, retail, and media. And then 
there are two sides in this model. There are people who are consuming this and people who create demand for services, digital services, across each dimension. And then there are there is supply. There are businesses or there are administrations, or other players who create facilities, who create uh, the possibility to use those services digitally, so they create supply. And within uh, within our uh, normalization uh, exercise, we had to normalize the data because they are very different physically, as you will see. So the idea was that one is maximum in the sample and zero is minimum in the sample. So zero doesn't mean that something is non-existent in this city, but just means that this city got the minimum out of the of the of the sample. Oh, pff, this you have in, in the books. It's not re very readable from from the screen, I guess, but uh, basically it describes the metrics uh, we used transport for, for for each of the dimensions and uh, for supply and demand. Uh, so basically. On the demand side, it was all about analyzing the search engine requests and mobile, uh, sorry, uh, social media requests. While on the supply side, it was much more complex. It, it, it varied a lot by category. In some cases, we used, um, for example, in administration or in healthcare, we used the assessment of the portals of, administra of regional administrations or portals of the hospitals and we just checked, uh, well, we had a checklist and we gave score for, for each function available. Then for finance it was about the accessibility of the banks which have the best uh, online offer for uh, on the market. Because in Russia you cannot open bank account remotely, you have to go to a branch present your passport and only then you can open the account. So if some bank in Vladivostok has perfect mobile or internet offering and you're in Moscow, you can't really use it. It's, it's not that useful for you. So um, the, the also the same applies to retail because in Russia the post services are notoriously, is notoriously bad and so many people do collect their online purchases in special places like you buy online and then they deliver to, to a special place and then you go and pick it up. So we estimated the accessibility of those places. Um, what was the objective, what we tried to, to measure or tried to capture? Uh, it was to understand what are the effects of this secondary digitalization. And we saw three groups of possible effects. It was about whether the regions get digital ecosystems, whether the businesses or no, some public offices which, which exist in the regions develop uh, services which, which go together into a unified ecosystem uh, with the, what they call network externalities, when, when you have digital finance, influence in digital transport, influence in digital retail, etc. So does, they, does this go smoothly together? And if it does, it can compensate for insufficiency of resources like the poorer cities, which have less revenues, they could theoretically get advanced through using digital technologies. They can leapfrog uh, compared to the cities which are richer. And then uh, we thought that it's all about quality of life because, uh, well, as you saw the model, it's, it's really about the life and it's uh, people in the center of the model. So. Uh, is digital contributing to the quality of life as perceived by residents of the cities? Um, uh, so the more specific questions were um, on the regional digital ecosystems. Is uh, digitalization synchronized across the dimensions? Like it goes more or less smoothly in a, in a circle? Or is it, I don't know, star-shaped, for example? Because theoretically, the higher the coherence between all the dimensions, the more likely is the emergence of multi-dimensional multi ecosystem. Then on the uh, leapfrogging uh, issue, what is actually the distribution of digitalization across the regions? Do the richer regions get more digitalized 
or do the poor regions use digital as, as a way to advance their development? And uh, finally, on the quality of life, the question is, are digital supply and demand coherent, or there are lags behind them, between them? And um, do people really feel that digital penetrates the important spheres of life? So, this was the idea behind, and now I'll give you some, some results. This is the list of 15 cities which have over 1 million of population in Russia. So, if you look at it, you can see... Do we have a... Ah. Moscow is by far the biggest, and then the second biggest, St. Petersburg, is about twice smaller than Moscow. And then the third biggest is about three times smaller than St. Petersburg. And then it goes more or less smoothly uh, from 1,500,000 to, to, to 1 million. It's, it's really quite smooth distribution here. And together, they, uh, those cities account for about 20% of population. Uh, they have about 25% of industrial output. And they have together about one third of the country GDP. So, generally, uh, Russia is quite concentrated and Moscow is really the center of, not just administrative center, but center of economic development. It's also constantly attracting people. In past 10 years, Moscow grew in population by 16%, while on average, the, the, the country population grew by just 2%, and some regions were massively losing population. There are regions which lost about 20% of their population in the past 10 years. Um, and mostly migration goes from towns to bigger cities and then to Moscow. So Moscow is getting the human capital from across the country. The digital picture is quite different from what we've seen. Because Yekaterinburg, which is relatively small, uh, Yekaterinburg is, well, it's number four in terms of population, but uh, in for two years it, w it has been uh, the number one in terms of digital penetration. Because the measurement we use uh, are weighted to the population of the city, so the big city like Moscow or St. Petersburg is in a relative disadvantage because, uh, well, it's definitely richer, but compared to the population it has to be massively more digitalized. Uh, so, for this reason, a more compact city like Yekaterinburg gets, gets on top. Um, and we see that, as measured by us, digitalization is growing quite, quite quickly. On average, the index grew by 50% within one, between two waves. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, we, we did the measurements in the end of the year, so it's basically December 12-14 and December 12-15. Uh, this is map of Russia. Here is, where is, <laughs> here it is, uh, Yekaterinburg, which is number one, um, Moscow and St. Pete. So uh, you, you don't have uh, a clear geographical pattern, basically. One thing is uh, the three southern cities are uh, in the bottom uh, of, of the ranking because they have, uh, they mostly rely on the Soviet time heavy industry and they ha also have relatively high share of population linked to agriculture. So they, they are sort of a bit backwards in, in this distribution. While there are some cities in Urals and Siberia which traditionally were the places where the Russian military industry was developing. For this reason, they had quite extensive R&D facilities, so they had very skilled workers uh, in, the, in the military plants, so uh, they have good uh, universities, uh, and the, those uh, Ural and Siberian cities are sort of more advanced um, in, in digitalization. Um, demand was growing much quicker than supply. You can see, oops, sorry, you can see here that demand has grown across practically all dimensions, 
while supply in many cases was stagnating. There was one dimension in which supply had actually decreased because uh, it was financed because the Russian central bank uh, started to work towards concentration of the banking sector, which led to some smaller banks which were very competitive in internet banking. They just got, uh, they lost their license, so they went out, out of the market. Um, in a sense, if we, if we look at the dynamics, it's about, as Marx has put it, rich get rich and poor get, poor, poor get poorer, uh, because um, here are the cities which have small penetration and which have small growth rates, and there is a group which is lagging behind clearly. There is a group that is stagnant, and this is quite a big group. Uh, few, just a few cities are sort of strengthening their leadership. Uh, it's uh, the index uh, in 2014 and the change in position. So those are who were weak in 2014. Um, ah, sorry, 2014 and 2015. So those are who were weak in 2014. Uh, those have improved their position. Those have remained stable. Uh, those worsened their position and they were weak. And those have improved their position, but they were relatively weak. Uh, in, in, I mean, they, they remained in, in the bottom of, of the ranking. Uh, and what's interesting that if we look at correlation between supply and demand, it's generally falling. There was only one dimension where it increased, it was media. Uh, in three cases, it has uh, increased quite dramatically in finance, in education, and administration. And overall, you can see that in most of the cases, uh, the correlation between supply and demand is quite low. Like, for example, 0 0.17, 0 0.18, there are two which are practically non-correlated. It's education and administration. It's across cities, yeah. Um, and if we look at the picture of, of correlation by city, uh, basically the thing is, uh, here is correlation 2015, correlation 2014. So everything which is beyond, be, above this diagonal is diverging while this is converging. So you can see that just five cities out of 15 are converging. And only in two of them, there is more or less strong positive correlation. In most cities, if we go city by city, it's negative and it's further diverging. And then if we uh, look at certain, let's say, dependencies between our index and the measurement, traditional measurements of the city's economic life, like uh, gross regional product, gross regional product per capita, production output, etc., etc. What we'll see is that supply is definitely highly uh, correlated with economic metrics. Like here, you can see supply correlated with industrial production, industrial production per capita. It's correlated with population, is correlated with per capita GDP, it's correlated with internet penetration. Uh, Supply is more correlated with internet penetration than demand. Uh, so, um, with number of domains per capita, etc. Interestingly, neither supply nor demand are correlated with high educational institutes, institutions uh, per thousand of population. We expected some dependence here, but we don't see any important correlation. Uh, it's, it's a bit negative, even. Uh, interestingly, the correlation is negative uh, with the rank ranking of 30 cities which are best for business in Russia. This <laughs> we really cannot explain, but just for, <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> uh, digital is not, um, not just not linked with, with doing business, but negatively linked with do doing business. Uh, well, uh, no, they, they are not, as far as I remember the ranking, they are not number one and two. There are other cities. Uh, 
uh, a bit on top, they are definitely in, in top five. But uh, I mean, overall, if we take the 15 cities with, uh, within our sample, the correlation with being good for business is negative. And speaking about demand, there is only one thing which is highly correlated with demand. It's what they call integral ranking uh, of uh, quality of life. There is a measurement made by leading uh, urban studies company called Urbanica, and they have a uh, quality of life index for 100 uh, Russian cities. And this, here we have very strong correlation between digital uh, demand and quality of life. Uh, this is just for illustration that the patterns can really vary quite a lot. Uh, by city, for example, here is Yekaterinburg, which is the leading one. You can see that demand was quite rounded, and then it got uh, skewed in one direction. Uh, then uh, you can see the uh, distribution of, for supply. And this is quite typical. Supply is usually much, much less rounded than demand. In another city, demand is almost star-shaped, and supply is definitely star-shaped. So there are just three or four dimensions which are developed. And these, uh, well, the, the, these are available for all 15 cities, but as I said, probably they don't make much, much sense for you. Uh, we see more or less the same picture across uh, industries. Uh, here, for example, is transport and demand for transport. You can see that it's not very evenly developed. Uh, then supply is definitely, uh, well, in, in, in a couple of cities, there is practically no, well, it's very low supply, while in others, it's really very much developed. Uh, here, I gave the example of education. Education is com very, very underdeveloped in, in, in terms of digital in Russia, while there is huge demand for, for digital education. And it was the fastest growing uh, dimension in terms of demand. So, and well, there is a whole book of, of this type of graphs, so you can look through them. Uh, coming to the conclusions, the secondary digitalization, we think it's still below the threshold of strong network externalities. So, I would call this digitalization from above because. It looks, we, we, we looked, among other things, you will see the cases of uh, regional digital companies in the book, and we really struggled to find them. We really struggled to find strong, interesting business, digital businesses coming from the regions. Just to give you the idea, uh, all top 20 e-commerce companies in Russia are headquartered in Moscow which is radically different from what we see in India or radically different from what we see in China, for example. In India, there will be companies from Delhi and the region, but also from Bangalore, also from Mumbai. In China, we'll see top 10 e-commerce companies spread more or less between the biggest cities of, of the country. It's Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, whatever. In Russia, it's very, very concentrated in Moscow. Uh, so, for this reason, there are, the network externalities are not working yet. We don't see any big city which has a really strong multidimensional digital ecosystem where players will be reinforcing one another, where finance will work for transport and transport will work for healthcare, whatever. And definitely this brings missed opportunities because um, digitalization seems to be not a driver of growth but a consequence of the current development of the region. The rich regions just invest more money into digital systems. Uh, so we don't see the technologies being used for leapfrogging, being used for leveraging of the development of less resourceful regions. And having said all this and uh, publishing a big report, what would, could we teach or could, could, what could we tell to business users or administration users? I mean, how we could make it useful for, for practical purposes. And I've, uh, I've been in quite a few audiences teaching this material and discussing with people from different industries how they can use this. So basically we came to the following model. 
uh, what is useful is this supply and demand gap analysis. And what is useful is supply and demand dynamics analysis, uh, because we have two waves and we can see some dynamics. And then business can get their strategies uh, informed. Whether it's national players who are trying to build networks, like if you are a bank and you need to settle priorities between key regions, or if you are a retailer and you want to settle priorities, marketing, etc., logistics. Or um, even if you are a small, relatively small local company from a certain city, you can also use these to get ideas and insights on how you should develop the business. So basically there are two strategies, like you either ride a wave, you go where the demand is already, but you obviously will meet competition there because if there is demand, probably there are some other people who have noticed this. Or you can try to occupy a niche, you can try to invest in creation of demand where it is underdeveloped yet, uh, pre well, with a chance to be the market player number one or market maker, but definitely this will be an, an investment. Uh, for administrations, it's a bit different story because um, what we see, and I think it's very, very important finding of our research, is this correlation between digital demand and quality of life. And quality of life is really quite important in Russia. As I said, Moscow is getting, getting the human capital from all across the country. And then also massively lose human capital to to the world, basically, through immigration. Because now, with, uh, with the globalization and with the current um, situation in the country, people can go not necessarily to Moscow, but to San, Di San Diego, Vancouver, Johannesburg, Canberra, Mumbai, Hong Kong, wherever. Uh, and now cities get in a situation where they really compete for the best people uh, with all the other cities in the world. And in Russia, it's a big problem because demographically we are very challenged. We have more or less stagnating demography, democracy, uh, demography sorry. We have <laughs> no sleep of the tongue. No sleep of the tongue. <laughs> we, 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 in Russia, we call it Freddy's sleep of the tongue. <laughs> yeah. We have stagnating demography, we have, we are not growing really in terms of population, population is aging. So if uh, cities want to have a boost to their economy, they need to compete for human capital, really compete. Uh, it's, it's a challenge for regional cities to get the best, best people and to keep them, to retain them. Uh, so, and we think that this sets the proper ROI for ro local administrations, regional administrations in their digital uh, initiatives because it's, it's a big question, especially in the <coughs> stagnating economy of <laughs> which we also have. Uh, it's, it's a big question how you settle the priorities and how you justify the investment uh, and how you measure the return of this investment. It's, it's uh, quite difficult for administrations to say I'll, I will develop my city digitally because the question is what do you get out of it and if you just use the economic metrics you probably don't get that much or you get it in quite long term. I've seen cases when people, well cities in, in states for example they introduce some smart traffic measure, traffic management system and then they estimate that they get 10 million US dollars of net profit over the investment of 17 uh, million US dollars and this net effect is for, for 10 years. So I mean, if you apply a standard IRR approach to this, it doesn't sound really impressive. But the thing is that it's not about getting some immediate economic effect, it's about getting boost in the competitiveness of your cities for in the competition for human capital. And speaking about future development, def oops, sorry, um, definitely we see huge boost in value of the research if we have an international uh, project because then we'll have benchmarks set probably across the three biggest countries of emerging world and um, it, it will 
massively uh, increase the, the practical value that businesses or administrations or poli po political decision makers uh, can get out, out of the research we do. So, as I said, I, I tried to be quick. Uh, I will be happy to answer your questions and then get into discussion. So, the cause, I mean, that kind of the what's in it for me thing, which is, so if I'm in administration of a city, you would ask the question, well, what's in it for me? Why would I want to make my city more digital and therefore more accessible to society? One of them you talked about is quality of life. Um, did you look at the um, kind of the implication beyond quality of life, did that translate into economic benefit for the residents? In other words, is the GDP per capita of a city that has a high advancement of digitization, does that tend to move faster, or is it too, too short of a research horizon right now to make that correlation? I would say it's just two waves of, uh, well, I, I, it looks, a bit too short, but it's, it's, it's a good question. Actually, we can try to, to look into some kind of economic effect and see if they are, well, we have stagnation or recession, so it's a bit challenging to measure, the, to compare the GDP development because there are certain issues which are very, very pressing uh, on the city economy. But I think it's really, it will be really interesting to try still to, to look for the effect. I'm not quite sure that we will find one, and if we don't find one, I think it does not, it will not mean that there is no one, just it, it, because of, of the shortness, but, but we'll try to do this. Well, and then conversely, for business, is there a correlation that says business somehow performs better, makes more money, is more profitable in cities that are more digitized? In other words, you talk about it here in terms of kind of points of entry, right, which is, you know, go into a new niche that isn't filled versus going into head to head competition. But kind of, my question is, so why? why? What, if I can make more money in a city that's not digitized, right, do I go into this because there's more opportunity for me to be more successful? Or if the economic income of the participants goes up, then I'm there, right? Because it's almost making the compelling case that if, if government supports digitization, free internet, wire the city, and the consequence is the residents are better off, the economic income is better for the individuals, and business actually benefits as well, then it really starts to become compelling. But it, it might be too short of a time horizon. Well, yes, that, that's an interesting perspective. Actually, probably we didn't think, we, we have here the sort of implication that the business has any way an imperative of going digital because of competitive situation or, well, I mean, especially in finance and retail. And the question for business is setting the regional priorities in this drive of going digital. I mean, it's 15 cities and still, as I said, in the Russian situation, um, in certain cases, even if you go digital, you still have to invest into certain physical infrastructure which is on the ground. You, it's, it's quite challenging to do business just online. And even the only full online bank that we have, uh, which is Tinkoff, he invested a lot into creating the network of agents who are spread more or less, and then there is a very creative, creative legal scheme behind this which was also an investment because, as I said, due to the legislation, you can't just open online account. You need to have a bank representative verifying your ID. And this, is, uh, this requires investment into physical structure, infrastructure. But that's a good question if we would preach to a business which, is, which has an alternative of going digital or, let's say, staying more or less in a traditional business model, how we would use this type of data in persuading to go digital uh, and whether we can demonstrate that being more digital 
is more effective economically through this research. Uh, I should think about how we could get this type of insight. I guess there is something in the data that we can use for this purpose. That's the strong point, and generally I, I would agree. I mean, this would not uh, probably pass the academic standards of rigor in terms of analysis, because we cannot demonstrate that those two sets of data are somehow physically matched, and you're right. Uh, the math, I mean, the mathematical thinking behind this is that if we analyze the correlations, and if we analyze the dynamics, as you said, uh, supply and demand should be somehow matched, and economically, yeah, definitely supply goes after demand somehow, but uh, there is probably inertia in, in creating supply in, in certain cases. So when we see that, uh, especially if we use the same methodology across years, if we see that one is uh, growing quicker, definitely quicker than the other. We can think about, we can, it's, it's probably difficult once again to, to prove with academic rigor, but with, from the uh, business sense point of view, we can think that there is certain gap and certain lag between the measurements. And especially as we do this across a set of 15 cities and across the set of seven industries, which creates, well, it's the universe of about 90 measurements. Uh, then, and two waves, it creates about almost 200 measurements. So uh, there is a certain, I would say, um, sort of uh, normalization between the cities. We, we, we use them as benchmarks for each, for each other. So, so 
basically there is no obvious reason why uh, one city like Ufa should be star-shaped in the development, while Yekaterinburg across the same approach and the same methodology is much more rounded. So we can, based on this, we can say that two are different at least in the quality or structural quality of uh, penetration of digital across those measurements. As, as I said in the beginning, uh, probably I didn't say it, but, but I just wrote this, we are in the area of using proxies. And, well, there, there can be an argument that those proxies are well, a bit creatively selected, probably. On the other hand, what we s sought for uh, in terms of uh, methodology, we wanted to have data which is um, independent from third parties. We didn't want to have proprietary data for, um, well, did I write this? Yeah, no, I didn't. Um, um, but the, the, yeah. The idea was to avoid proprietary data uh, for two reasons. One, it's, uh, it may require some money, but this was not important. It, it always requires lots of negotiations. If you go to a telecom provider and ask it, please share data with us, then you get, at least in Russia, into rounds and rounds and rounds of negotiations, what specific data, on which terms, which will give, which will not give, and then probably get this arrangement for one year, and then next year they have change in management and they say, no, 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 no we don't give you this data anymore. And so when, when you, there are plenty of ways to get quality, in theory, quality data through proprietary data, banks, telecoms, I don't know, uh, even city administrations, etc. But then you became, become very, very dependent on, on, on the supply of this data, which we wanted to avoid at this stage. We wanted to do something which we can go and replicate whenever we want, not, not, not depending on anybody. Uh, but yes, uh, in a sense, you're right. It's uh, mm, it's very challenging uh, in terms of. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's, it's uh, probably it, it would not uh, you would not uh, uh, publish this academically because it's very challenging to demonstrate the dependencies and the match of two sets of physically very different data. If I may, <coughs> a couple of things just to add a perspective. First of all, when we started uh, this uh, research, uh, we wanted to provide some sort of the alternative way for uh, business strate strategists and uh, strategists in administration to think about the digital uh, phenomenon and how it can transform the city as a place for doing business and as a place for living. So uh, given the fact that the digital is, a, is, is an evolving phenomenon is probably not that easy to measure. And in, in, in regard to this secondary digitalization perspective in particular, because all those hard where side of it has already been measured and discussed and probably uh, the hard data is more available and you can do more uh, rigorous sort of research on that. But w what we were trying to uh, produce was something like um, more of the, uh, to enrich the creativity of, you know, creative thinking of the strategists. Why would they, uh, uh, see the difference between the way how people really use the technology to buy or uh, well mainly through the consumption perspective so, so that was that was an idea and actually uh, it's not mentioned here maybe but uh, we've come up with some sort of the very clear uh, idea that the strategies of the business uh, in Russia is not uh, very um, kind of uh, uh, flexible in regard to the local demand. What we see is that, as uh, you mentioned, that uh, that we see that most of the business that come from Moscow and Saint, Saint Petersburg, they uh, 
they apply the same patterns to each and every city and they do not adopt to this or that change in, in local demand. While the local entrepreneurial activity is probably not uh, all the time uh, sufficient to address the local demand, so we simply don't have local players. So that's, that's some sort of the findings that are probably not truly academic, but we believe that they can enrich uh, the thinking of the strategist on, on, on the side of the business. And the other perspective, uh, which is also, um, uh, I believe is important about this research, is that we try to talk digital, we try to talk digital about digital because we used all the, those check-ins and queries and all the things, so it's not the traditional way of collecting, the conventional way of collecting data, because we are, we are trying to address the, the new phenomenon using the new methods. So that was also a, a, a cause for uh, probably sort of, uh, well, uh, not very aligned, uh, outcomes, but uh, we believe that uh, we should keep on uh, doing these sort of things, maybe with all necessary uh, disclaimers, but this sort of thinking is, and uh, this sort of data that we, we, we are using, and the methods of gathering data, probably that, that, that we, we should not get rid of them, we should probably build up on them. Because the, 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 the famous thing is that Google uh, forecasts the uh, flu pandemic more accurate than, than FDA or the National Health Administration, simply because they are they're quick and they just use their queries. So why why not using why not trying to involve this into uh, the research? So that was that was an idea why we uh, consciously <laughs> went into this field of uncertainty and lack of uh, uh, hard data. No, I, uh, and I thought that was a good thing to do, to measure the demand and the supply separately. But to address Albert's point, maybe uh, you know, there can be some triangulation. Uh, maybe somebody in some city doesn't search for transport because they know it's not there. Uh, well, uh, yes, then we will see the more or less correlated uh, supply demand. I mean, if, if both are non-existent, then they are correlated. <laughs> the, the no, they're not correlated, they're measuring the same thing. Yeah. That's my point, that yeah. the demand reacts to the supply. It's not, they would love to use online, but mm -hmm. what you're measuring is the equilibrium, which, you know, Exactly. Yes, He's going looking for a store that doesn't exist. Well, well, uh, I would. I mean, it is not as bad as the economists' equilibrium because <laughs> their supply has to equal demand. Here, it is an expressed interest in some knowing something. So I mean, in, in at least it's not definitionally the same. But well, finish your point about the triangulation. You know? Yeah, but I mean, if there are some other ways of, um, I don't know. I'm just. Uh, I was just reacting to Albert's point. Yes. Well, part, part of the check for me was that when we did this uh, correlation, I mean, it's, uh, it's probably not, once again, scientific economic rigorous test, but if we look at the correlation of what we have measured uh, coming from, let's say, absolutely model thing, uh, those correlations do make sense. And those are, I mean, directly observable things which are measured by, by, by independently, uh, not linked to us. And uh, it's sort of probably one of the checks possible. Uh, then um, speaking about demand, the, the, the digital demand is uh, as measured by search, searches, for example, uh, is a bit, different, I would say, from the classic economic demand in one uh, sense, it's, it's sort of global. I mean, if you in your city, in traditional economy, did not know that something exists, you couldn't demand for this because you were, you were living more or less an isolated economy, so if there was no knowledge, there was no demand. Digital changes this because 
most in most cases you have the knowledge of, of the global of the global theoretical supply. Like I, if I don't have a pizza delivery in my city online, I still may know that there are pizza delivery services in other cities. And that's why I, I may have demand which is I, I, I search for pizza delivery in my city uh, because I know that there is one in Moscow and St. Pete, I don't know, in Novosibirsk and New York. Even if there, if, even if there happens to be no pizza delivery services in in, in my in my city, so there there can be this type of mismatch. At least theoretically, I can imagine how it how it happens. For I don't know, for retail, for finance, I may not have local bank with a good internet uh, banking offer, but still I can try to to to, to find one, uh, and then I, I find out that there is no. Not, nothing available, and then I go a bit upset. But but so we, 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 with our methodology, we sort of capture these, I say, potential demand. Demand probably. You are right that this is not exact demand in 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 terms of classic economy. It's more about the potential something which people theoretically could use if there was enough of supply for, on the let's say local level. Some of these uh, services, uh, digital services, are local, but others need not be. Right? Like, uh, uh, did you look at local university MOOCs for some reason? Or, uh, well, otherwise, why do I care where I get the MOOC from as long as? Yes, uh, this is probably one dimension where the, the, the very idea of MOOC is to be global. <laughs> So for this reason, it's not um, really important for people on the one hand that it's, uh, it's supply, supplied by local university, but still um, there are reasons to get uh, something online from a local university is because it's easier to get diploma, for example, you can have mixed uh, a mixture of online and offline interaction, etc. So, uh, for but but you are right, and it's um, we've got this point also from EY Alexei Rimnikov that this is the dimension where the very idea of digitalization of education is to to, to get the global audience. In most of the other, uh, I mean, in all other dimensions, uh, you definitely want local supply, or you have to have local supplies in term, in, in cases of bank, for example. You definitely. In healthcare, you want to have <laughs> your local hospital being digitally developed. In administration, you want your local administration being digitally developed, etc. Yeah, but with education, yeah, you're you're right. Yes, uh, with e-commerce, as I said, it's probably specific to to Russia with the post services being very, very unreliable. Lots of people, uh, they get, uh, they use those delivery points, especially in the regions when you want to get something from Moscow, for example, Moscow shop, you would probably not order it via post, but you will order this to, to, to this delivery point because then it's operated. Uh, Biggest e-commerce uh, retailers in Russia, they have their own logistic services, so they can deliver not door to door, but to those centers. And then uh, it's, well, once again, it's not 100% of, of the cases, but we think it's quite approximate to, to, to measure the development of uh, e-commerce, specifically in Russia. In the markets like US, where you have great postal services, next day you get basically your purchases. There is definitely no need to, to, to have any collection point uh, for, for e-commerce.